Very good. It's just past uh, eight o'clock, so I think we'll begin. Uh, as the founding director of the Insiders Outsiders Project, it's my very great pleasure to be the one introducing and sharing tonight's event. As some of you will already know, the Insiders Outsiders Project's primary remit is to celebrate the tremendously rich and diverse contribution of refugees from Nazi-dominated Europe to British culture, and Elizabeth Friedland is certainly a very good candidate in that respect. Um, I'd also like, though, uh, to say that I'm working very much in cahoots, as it were, <laughs> in partnership with both Jewish Renaissance and by extension the Lions Learning Project, this series of which this event is part, Spies, Lies and Secret Missions, the unsung Jewish heroes of World War II, um, is very much a collaboration. Uh, the plan for today is slightly unusual in that I will obviously, I'm saying a few words, I'm going to introduce our two main speakers, and then we're going to have a chance, as it were, all together to watch the wonderful, quite short film that Catherine Maynell, one of our uh, participants today made in 2017 about our main subject today, Elizabeth Friedlander. Um, so let me start by introducing Catherine very briefly. I have to say I asked both Catherine and Julia Weiner for a short paragraph and they're both obviously very modest and gave me a very, very <laughs> short paragraph and I could say much more, but let me let me keep it short. Um, Catherine Manel is a, uh, an artist, a writer and a scholar working with moving image, performance, drawings and artist books. And in her own words, she's interested in the personal and the political in humor, feminist strategies, and subjectivities in a lived world. Her interlocutor tonight is Julia Weiner, who I think many of you will have come across. She's currently Associate Professor of Art History and Director of Content for Liberal Arts, <laughs> bit of a mouthful, at Regents University London. Uh, and perhaps most uh, pertinently for today's proceedings, in 2017, she co-curated with Naomi Games um, a wonderful exhibition held at the Jewish Museum here in London called Design on Britain, a great title, looking quite explicitly and you know, in sort of celebrating the contribution of the emigres to design in this country in all its many facets. Um, and indeed, it included Elizabeth Freelander's work. Uh, there's much more one could say, but Julia also writes regularly about art for both the Jewish Chronicle and a number of other Jewish and indeed non-Jewish publications. As for the film, it's 23 minutes long. It's not a documentary. Let me just say this straight away. And I know that Julia, you will be talking to Catherine about the format and the way that this film is crafted. But let me just um, again quote, I think, um, Catherine. Uh, I assume this is something you yourself wrote on uh, the Lux website. The film takes an essay form. I don't know how many of you in the audience are familiar with the essay film concept. It's something perhaps we can talk about later. Describing what is known of Elizabeth Friedlander's life, it is simply called incidentally Elizabeth, uh, using archive footage interspersed with landscape and speculative images and text, probing the practical and political life of women surviving on wit and skill in early 20th century Europe. I think that's a lovely way of, of putting it. So I think, Emma, if I can turn to you now to uh, set the ball rolling with watching the film itself. Thank you very much. Starting with the desert island disc question. What would you take with you? <coughs> Consider it an aspect of self-identity, a reflection of your society and who you had been, a touchstone to the past and a sense of that which remains with you wherever you happen upon. What would you take with you? Elizabeth Betty Friedlander left Berlin in 1936 with her mother's 1703 Klotz violin and her portfolio. And if I told you that this violin fetched up at the Cork School of Music, would you wait for me to tell you how it got there? Born in 
After studying at the Berlin Academy with the distinguished Art Nouveau designer and calligrapher Emil Rudolf Weiss, Elizabeth had a salaried position at Ulstein Verlag, the largest printing and editorial company in Europe, which produced several newspapers, including Berlin's first tabloid, magazines and non-fiction books. Elizabeth Friedlander was working on the highest circulation luxury title, Die Dama. She was in her late 20s at the start of her career. Die Dama gave rich women agency. They were photographed in blazers, smoking and driving cars. As a graphic designer, Elizabeth Friedlander was responsible for the stylish hand-drawn titling of the articles. It is around then that E.R. Weiss introduced Elizabeth to Georg Hartmann of the Bauer Type Foundry in Frankfurt, for whom in about 1928 she started to design a font. Originally it was have to been called Friedlander Schrift, but using a Jewish name became impossible. Eventually, in all its sizes, it was issued as Elizabeth, with the English spelling, in 1939, by which time Elizabeth herself had fled. For Hartmann, who had become a loyal friend, it was his Lieblingsschrift, or favourite, most loved font. I have a copy of the Bauer Almanac for 1939, produced for the New York office. It uses Elizabeth font. The cover is rough, thick, buff paper, elegant text in black and red, with a border printed blind, that is, embossed without ink. Inside is pale, creamy, white archer paper, described as velvet smooth. Before the calendar, there is in retrospect, with war declared the following September, what seems to be a rather sad greeting. The intent and resolve of many of us must be that the cordial goodwill of this season extend throughout the full 12 months. That year, the influential British design magazine, the Penrose Annual, had featured a review by the typographer Robert Harling, referring to Elizabeth as undoubtedly the year's most successful type, the most distinguished. There seemed to be no weak spot in the font. In the early 20th century, the world of Western typography was fairly small and women were rarely involved. One other is Anna Simons. Their lives curiously intersect. Simons, professionally barred by her gender in Germany, had come to the Royal College of Art and studied with Walter Crane and then Edward Johnstone. She had in turn taught calligraphy to E. R. Weiss, who was to be Friedlander's professor at the Berlin Academy. By a circuitous route and a bit of serendipitous coincidence, I got drawn into this story. I was in the St. Bride Typographical Library, which was hopelessly catalogued and only sporadically open due to funding issues. The occasional librarian handed me New Borders, The Working Life of Elizabeth Friedlander by Pauline Pauker. And a light bulb came on. Things stacked up, fell into place. There isn't an adequate metaphor, but I already knew some of this stuff. I had recently found two books of poetry in calligraphic hand in my grandfather Francis's bookcase some 40 years after his death. One was initialed E.F. and the other simply signed Elizabeth. Now chancing across this book, I came to know their origin. In this small press edition, I read that Elizabeth Friedlander had struggled to leave Germany, had wished to emigrate to the US with reference letters from Hartmann, Toscanini and Noel Coward, but the process was too slow. She went to Milan where she worked for the publishers Mondadori, and when the vicious race laws were introduced in Italy in September 1938, came to England on a domestic service visa provided by the Society of Friends. Refugees were not very welcome then either. Where, hearing of her arrival, Francis Menel, also a typographer, found work for her. 
By 1942, she was in charge of design at Ellick Howe's Black Propaganda Unit, room 611 at Bush House, where she produced forged Wehrmacht and Nazi rubber stamps, false ration books, and so on. How sweet that must have been. I relish just saying it. Her impressive career included design for Reader's Digest, Thames and Hudson, Jonathan Cape, patterned papers for Kerwin Press and Penguin, trademarks and monograms for Saxon Shoes, Mills and Boone, the Folio Society, the London University Coat of Arms and Calligraphy for the Roll of Honour at Sandhurst. She was responsible for many of the post-war designs of Penguin books. Elizabeth Friedlander retired to Kinsale in 1961. Her papers were collected by Lord Mayor of Cork, Gerald Yael Goldberg, and subsequently went to the Boole Library. Pauline Pauker's book is well-researched and scholarly, with wonderful indexes and patterned paper samples, although a personal sense of Elizabeth Friedlander remains elusive. If I look hard enough, there might be small clues left in Friedlander's selection of poetry, the violin and her choice of friends, A.F. Magri McMahon, one time professor of classics at the University of Milan before his anti-fascist activities forced him to leave. Alice Schwab, art collector and intellectual, also mother to Rabbi Julia Neuberger. Sir Francis Menel and Alec Howe, already mentioned. Sheila and Gerald Goldberg and Walter, son of Arturo Toscanini, for whom she designed record labels. I look at the selection of poetry E.F. wrote in her best calligraphic hand for Francis. Love, endless love, mercy, pity, peace, unconditional love, constant love. Emotions described, some more abstract with poetic effects. Verbs. Friedlander's beautiful writing as wedding gift. My grandfather's third wedding. It has a vellum binding, very simple and exquisitely crafted. It was Francis's wife, Bay's first wedding, a late one. A decade or so earlier, someone had died in an aeroplane accident. That previous love of Bay's life was also lover to Vera Mendel, Francis's second wife, and lover to God knows who else, including Bay's sister, with three in a sleeping bag camping. So in my eyes, this dead lover was a bit of a shit. Though this was Bloomsbury and jealousy is bourgeois and despised. I don't mention this for salacious reasons or to undermine the romance of this wedding, but it adds a complexity to what might otherwise appear a simple idea of love. In this first volume of poetry, Elizabeth wrote for Francis, she chose Thomas Nash, W.B. Yeats, Francis Menel, William Blake, St. Paul to the Corinthians, Alice Menel, John Wilby, W.H. Davies, and Shakespeare Sonnet 116, Love Alters Not. And I look at the other volume, written for Francis's 60th birthday, with essays as well as poems. And it's all cows and rivers and trees and fish and rain and gardens, birds and moss and ducks. Friedlander's choice shows an extensive knowledge of English literature, it is an homage to the person she will gift it to and includes poems by the recipient and his mother. The taste is familiar and I know it would both flatter and be admired by him. A fabulous shiny mirror held up for him, a perfect gift, a charming and erudite selection. But where is she to be found? Allusions and alliterations, anecdotes and authorial intrusions, but where can I find a sense of Elizabeth Friedlander? I asked Pauline Pauker what choice Elizabeth Friedlander made in a similar volume for Ellie Howe, expert on magic and the occult, who ran the wartime propaganda unit where Elizabeth was in charge of design work, because Pauline had seen it. She tells me that it is about Pekingese, a text describing the breed, a popular one amongst Pekingese fanciers as both Elik Howe and his wife were. So there I have it. 
these gifts were made for the other person to appreciate. What there is of her is in the script, choice of ink, margin, paper, binding. This is the era of modernism, when good design had clean lines, a time in which a work of art was evaluated without the personal and with a sense in which these could be considered separately. I think about this in respect of Elizabeth Friedlander and her work. The texts of these anthologies were a little old fashioned, perhaps. Or were they intended to be timeless? And I think about the early 20th century writings of James Joyce, T.S. Eliot and Gertrude Stein, notwithstanding. Powerful avant-garde experiments in rhythms where form is meaning, and I reach for a chair and sit. And while I am hoping for something solid, it all slips away. I learned that Elizabeth Friedlander had organised her archive with little personal material mainly collating her work as a designer, typographer and calligrapher. And so I imagine her as a private person. While I am considering that, a friend reminds me of Stanley Morrison's 1930s essay, First Principles of Typography, in which he advocates arranging the letters, distributing the space and controlling the type as to aid to the maximum the reader's comprehension. And the printer as a servant of the community in this humble job, such that individualism is not helpful. Somehow, I hope here to show how these ideas reflect not a series of non sequiturs, but threads that conceptually intersect, but they also appear as if chance. And then actually by chance, while I am grappling with the underpinnings of modernist thought, I learned that Gerald Goldberg was writing a PhD on Leopold Bloom, the fictional protagonist and hero of James Joyce's Ulysses. And it was Dr. Goldberg who provided Pauline Pauker with access to material for her book. Friedlander left her papers and her Klotz violin to her dear friend Sheila Goldberg, Gerald's wife. At the time of Pauline's visit, Sheila was in a nursing home, unable to remember. Gerald gave inconsistent accounts of Elizabeth's family. She had a sister living in England, sometimes also a brother or nephews and nieces, but they had become estranged because her sister had forgotten her Judaism. And I wonder if in the account of this sister, Gerald Goldberg projected his own more orthodox feelings. I struggle with this rift, as Elizabeth Friedlander does not seem to have been observant and she had a long-standing relationship with Sandro, Alessandro Magri McMahon, whom she joined in Kinsale, and where she had also done an inscription for the local church. And if you were adrift in the world, you would surely not deliberately lose sight of your sister for theological niceties. But only a few postcards from the sister were to be seen in the boxes. These boxes to which I am hoping to negotiate access, but more on that later. I admonish myself to resist lazy, critical confusions of life and art and reductive notions of causality. But I want to know more than the bare outline of facts, to flesh her out as it were. And I want the grist of the material to be factual. In nonfiction, people are expected to have verifiable existences you can look up. I make endless online searches for Friedlander, born in Charlottenburg, Berlin, and there are a number, but none that seem to quite work, however hard I tried to make them fit. I must suppress conjecture, and yet it is what drives me on. The second volume of poetry I have is all rural idyll. As I said before, cows and rivers and trees and fish and rain and gardens, birds and moss and ducks. Francis was living between London and Suffolk and Elizabeth, whose eyesight was weakening, was about to move from London. 
In Kinsale, Elizabeth lived modestly, supplementing her income by handcrafting keepsakes for tourists. Although it lacked a sea view, her cottage had a garden where she proudly grew a range of vegetables from Italian seeds, a necessary effort for availability of ingredients which the spattered pages of her copy of L'Arte di Mangiare Bene attest to. Sandro lived close by and they socialised together with the Goldbergs and the Cork Literati, including Molly Keane and Elizabeth Bowen. It could not have been a dull life. The poetic delight of a rural idyll. Then a gloom comes over me as I think of the flip side. When this becomes not reassuring but uncertain with environmental pressure. Notions reminiscent of Lebensraum lurk here. This noxious fear fueled by desire for food security merged with fascist ideologies and geopolitical ambitions was the toxic brew of the 20th century. Still is. But if I can take a step back, I can reimagine the gentle, calm country in this book of carefully scripted words. Elizabeth's choice here seems so much more than a reflection of Francis's taste and political sensibilities, in that it excludes the wider world of ugly upheavals. And in suppressing that, I sense its absence. Latterly, Elizabeth's nickname was Dormouse because she was apt to fall asleep in her chair. She was a quiet person by all accounts, as well as being modest, almost self-effacing. Elick Howe indexes her in his book, The Black Game, British Subversive Operations Against the Germans During the Second World War, without a surname, and describes her as a demure spinster in her late thirties. Perhaps this was affectionate, but it reads badly today. Looking at a grainy photograph of her, she has her hair in a bun. Did the notoriously predatory Ella Cow just mean that she didn't wear makeup or high heels? Had her past made her unwilling to draw attention to herself? It strikes me as odd to consider anyone from the creative milieu of 1930s Berlin as demure. She was strong-willed and most surely brave. She had been working in Germany until she was legally prohibited, receiving a formal letter in 1935 stating that, As you are a non-Aryan and as such you lack the necessary reliability and fitness to participate in the creation and dissemination of German cultural values, I forbid you to continue to practice your profession as a graphic designer. Elizabeth navigated Europe as a displaced person, aided only by her brilliance as a designer. Demure does not cut it for me. Demure is a carapace. I form an opinion that in the deliberate abandonment of individualism, she also discarded a saga of victimization. So a paradox emerges where Elizabeth Friedlander's personal story is both frustratingly absent, but also defiantly resistant. I have laid out my vested interests, my partiality and reasoning. I hope the importance of Elizabeth Friedlander is evident. It is a compelling but somewhat elusive story. Here, other factors emerge and exasperate me with their banality. I ring the number at the bottom of the page that has been forwarded from a librarian to an archivist. She is very apologetic, but there is no access to the papers as they are unlisted. Eventually, after referring the matter and pleading my case, I am granted limited access. But what of the postcards from her sister? Or the Tuscanini letters Gerald Goldberg had threatened to burn to avoid prurient interest? And might we know what happened to her parents, Elfrida and Wilhelm? 
her archive, the 14 or so boxes. Her naklas is largely unavailable for lack of about 30,000 euros. No funding for the work of Elizabeth Friedlander, one of the most important figures in the history of women in typography and graphic design. I never got round to telling you about the violin. And now back to Desert Island Discs. What would you take with you? Lovely. Thank you very much, uh, Emma, for orchestrating that. And of course, thank you so much, Catherine, for allowing us to um, share the lovely film with everyone here tonight. Uh, so I think without further ado, let me hand over to Julia to be in conversation with the film's director. Thank you, Monica, and thank you, Catherine, for sharing that film with us. So as the uh, film tells us, um, a little bit anyway, you first came across Elizabeth Friedlander's work when researching women designers, and as the film shows there, you realised that Elizabeth had known your grandfather. Um, can you tell us a bit more about your grandfather, how he came to meet um, Elizabeth, and also a little bit more about how he helped her? Um. I think Francis had been aware of her work for quite a number of years before she came to England um, because the Penrose Annual, which for people who don't know that era of design, was actually the kind of big text um, which flagged up all the latest technical developments and all the sort of aesthetic considerations of that year. It was a really big deal. And Robert Harling had written in the 39 one um, how, how beautiful, about how beautiful Elizabeth um, typeface was. Now, it turns out when, you, when I finally got hold of a copy of this, that in fact, Francis had been the editor of that volume. So when he said um, to the home office, and I'm just trying to find the um, exact text of that, but when he said to the home office that he um, had known her for a certain amount of time, I think literally speaking, that was true, but he writes, um, I've known Miss Friedlander since October 1941, when as a stranger, she brought me specimens of her work, which I'd long admired without knowing their origin. As a result, I engaged her as a designer in November 41, and she did excellent work for me until the end of August 42, when she was called to a job with the PID, an example of her loyalty and security. I would mention that she has never told me what this is, assignment was or with whom, but it happened that I knew it also as secret from the employing end. Miss um, Friedlander has become our close personal friend and my wife, Miss Kilroy of the Board of Trade would, if necessary, go on record as one convinced of Miss Friedlander's loyalty and serious purpose. As for her work as a type designer, decorator and typographer, if it is first rate, and provides just that lively novelty which should help her English colleagues to avoid the dangers of complacency. Um, so he was certainly aware of her work. I guess he literally hadn't met her till 41 because he probably wouldn't have written that otherwise. But they did become friends, not, not terribly close friends, but I think long-standing and important friends. She, I've seen from the... Um, book that my grandparents kept, did visit for weekends in the country with them. And um, 
Francis did go and see her, I think just before both of them died in the 60s in Ireland. And he hadn't been back to Ireland for many, many years because of his early youth of political involvement. Um, I think in particular Roger Casement and nationalist causes and stuff. And he'd been so disgusted with what had happened there that he hadn't gone back. But um, he did eventually, I think, um, late 60s or early 70s, just before he died, go back and visit her in Kinsale. So she was clearly very important to him. And he was a designer himself, as well as a poet, as is, is referenced. Yeah, so can yeah. You tell me a bit more about his design and work and how he was able to help Elizabeth. I mean, we've got obviously that letter, but there were other ways, weren't there? Yeah, um, well, he'd... Um, he started work in um, printing. His father was a publisher, big Catholic press, Westminster Press, um, which is where I think he knew Stanley Morrison from. And then he went on and he got involved in, um, oh, newspapers and advertising. He, at the time at which he met Elizabeth Friedlander, he was a director at Mathers, which is now Ogilvy. So, you know, what was probably smaller then, but a big advertising company. He was a um, broad designer for industry. He was on the Mint Commission, so on. So, um, yeah, he was quite, he, he was quite um, well connected and could pull quite a lot of strings, I guess. Um, but he'd always been very, staunchly anti-fascist. He'd been a communist for a while. Um, he wasn't allowed to work in the political intelligence office, although he wanted to because of his political involvements previously. Um, but he obviously knew Alec Howe very well. Uh, so should we have a, have a look at some of those designs? Um, so your grandfather was able to help Elizabeth get work for Thames and Hudson, The Times, and also some rather wonderful Christmas cards. And I think you've brought us some images to share. Uh, yeah, um, from, from the exhibition. I mean, the exhibition was really a wonderful, a wonderful moment. Um, and let me see, can I screen can share? Where the exhibition was and when, for those of us who, there we, yeah, it's the first yeah. one, isn't it? The exhibition was at Ditchling Museum, um, which uh, is, uh, does things around type and design mostly, um, and likes to have people with connections. And there were, um, th there were some rather tenuous connections that we managed to make in order to have this exhibition. I'm standing here in front of um, one a marvelous big rub down, which you can see the Elizabeth script and the um, penguin design that we had as a sort of grand entrance to the thing. And I'm with Cronin O'Dublin, who's the um, head of research archives at um, Cork UCC. Um, and actually was the person who managed to get me into the collection, which is very, very difficult to get into. Um, but uh, then I'll show you some installation shots. This is, um, you can see in the front here, lots of book covers of Friedlanders. And then there are some cards and the violin. Um, And that's a shot from the other side uh, with some uh, mastheads on the right for various things she tried out, some of which were used and some weren't, um, some, some for the times. Um, and then, uh, let me think, the, the uh, sorry, it's taking me a while for these things to load. Um, various things here to do with advertising, whip bread, beer, uh, insoles for Saxon shoes, um, which she drew out beautifully. I don't have it here, but she also did a whole series of makeup things. And because of her design skill, she even designed 
not not just the sort of packaging, but the mechanism by which the lipstick would rise and fall. So she, I mean, technically she was quite extraordinary. Um, this is one of some of the cards that she made. She was she was wonderful at sending Christmas cards and things like that. Um, and she was commissioned also to make quite a number. I'll try and zoom in so you can see the variety. But you've got Mills and Boons, The Economist, Mondadori, Alan Shepard, um, Sharp Club, Jewish Chronicle, Synagogue Library, um, Alice Schwab there, ex lots of ex Libras that she did, very beautiful ones. This is for Sandro, her good friend who she lived near in um, Kinsale. Um, this is the wood block. I mean, she was extraordinary in the way she carved these blocks. They are quite exquisite. Um, this is the St. Paul's with searchlights that you saw in the film, and that's the little wood block for that. And then my very favorite is this, which was, um, I think, her, her 1955 card that she made in blocks like that. And then you can see it as a hanging piece here, which I think, yeah, I absolutely love that as a, as a thing. Um, so a, a, a lot of things like that. Um, Thank you, yeah. yeah. And okay. um, yes, I think that was exactly what I wanted to show the, the Christmas cards, but as, as it says in the film, and as you've just mentioned, um, it was possibly, it was your grandfather who introduced her to Alec Howe, so that she therefore got involved um, in, in designing um, black propaganda. Can you tell us a little bit more about what you've managed to discover about this rather shady subject? Not shady, but, you know, difficult to discover subject. Yeah, yeah I, um, it is very difficult to, to discover and she didn't really keep very much information. Uh, well, she didn't keep anything. There's one card that she made. Um, no, I think two cards that she made while she was working there that she kept copies that um, refer obliquely to the room number. And that's the only way you would know that that was where that had been made, including one with some um, very beautiful moving between the black letter form um gothic form and the sort of more traditional roman form and she did all that lettering herself uh so really quite extraordinary um piece of design um and then looking back through things trying to think about that again she did do some work for um in the unit that Alec Howe has flagged up. Um, and I thought, well, some of this I'd like to share with you if I can. I'll try again. Um, okay, sorry, I'm gonna close that one. Uh, oh, no, I'll come to that in a minute. So this is the, if it'll load, this is the one, this is the Christmas card she sent um, from room 609A, EH is Alec Howe. I don't know who CC is and EF is obviously Elizabeth Friedlander. And you can see her working drawings here for what was just simply a Christmas card. I mean, extraordinary amount of work went into these things. Um, She did this in, I found this, I went back to Alec Howe's book in the library the day before yesterday. Forgive me, they're not very good photographs, but they were just taken in the library on my phone. <coughs> um, Alec Howe was interested in the occult and um, he thought that that might be a route through somehow with psychological warfare. Um, and he did this Nostradamus prophecies as a sort of false one. Um, his thought, I, I guess, was that quite a lot of prominent Nazis, including the propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, was interested in this. Um, 
whether it actually had any effect on anything, who knows? It's quite interesting as an idea. Um, this is another thing that's attributed to Elizabeth Friedlander again in Alec Howe's book, but none of this stuff was kept by Elizabeth Friedlander herself. Um, this is quite interesting because she was known for doing rubber stamps. And this is a, a forged document and it's in Alec Howe's book. And here is a rubber stamp. So one has to assume that was hers, even if I don't have any kind of proof of it just the stamp, the lettering on that. So I think that gives one a kind of um, idea of, uh, of what sorts of things she was up to. Just quite a wide range of things using her, her skill and also, I guess, her training because she would have known how to do accomplished Hebrew script and she did these various different letter forms um, as part of her training and upbringing and so on. So she was terrifically skilled. And what did they use these things for? The for do you know anything more about how they used um, this Nostradamus or they they sent out copies into Germany? She also did forged ration books and things like that, and that was quite important um, because people who were going into Germany would need to be able to eat and so on. Um, yeah, all sorts. I, I think just literally all sorts of stuff. Right, very good. So um, we, uh, I would like to go back now to look at Friedlander's career before she came to the UK. She was born, as we know from the film, in Berlin and studied there at the Berlin Academy. But she's most famous probably for the typeface um, <laughs> that she designed for the Bayer Type Foundry in Frankfurt, designed as early as 1933 but not cut until 1939, by which time she'd long left Germany. And we've got an example of it on the wall behind you. Um, she is one of the first, if not the first woman to design a major typeface. Can you tell us a little bit more about Elizabeth typeface? We can go back to the story of why it's called Elizabeth, why it's so important and its continued popularity today. Um. I, it is simply very beautiful, but it's also slightly quirky, but not in a very obvious way. So for me that, I mean, I'm not a typographer and not a type designer, and I'm simply talking about the typeface that she designed, not the one that was then digitized um, a number of years ago by Bauer, by um, Andrew Balius, a, a, I think a Spanish designer, which, which is good, but it evens out a lot of the quirk and it's less elegant to my mind. Um, there, it looks like a fairly conventional Roman typeface. And then you start looking, some letters, not all, um, are very slightly tapered upwards. So it gives it a kind of almost art deco, slightly jazzy feeling, something, everything's a little bit elongated. It's not quite what you'd expect, but it's so close. And um, each letter form is obviously separately designed. So although there's a kind of uniformity, there's also exceptions here and there. It's just really beautiful and it must have been quite a thing to have done. And, and it still looks very good to my mind and it's still in use. Um, I mean, I think this is what's so remarkable. There'd been very few women um, type designers in that era. There were very few, but there was absolutely nobody who had produced something that was internationally successful on that scale. You know, it was used in the States, it was used in parts of Africa, it was used all over the place. People loved it. And for good reason. Yeah, no, it is. It's uh, really striking, and um, and also you've got it's obviously was um, a, a, um, uh, given out in two forms. So you've got the italicized form as well. It's just 
wonderful in both of them. And um, I know it was in the film, but we can just repeat this story that um, most, most um, the fonts would be named after their uh, designer, their surname, but it is true that Friedlander was frowned upon. We saw that terrible letter. I know that was one, the one sent to Volpe, but Friedlander got the same letter saying, as a Jew, you can no longer do it. And uh, so, yeah. I, I don't actually, I mean, I assume she had to. Um, Pauline gave me that letter, Pauline Pauker, um, who wrote the book that was, um, that, that first brought, the whole thing to my attention that I found in the um, St Bride Library, but um, yeah, I, I it it is something that all Jewish workers would have been given, and I think she had um, not very long to just get the hell out. So let's um, talk just a little bit about one we see in the film about Didama and this elegant German women's publication. Um, I think you've got a few more images to show us of the work she did there. And when she was forced to flee Germany, um, she didn't come straight here like many did. She, in fact, went south first to Italy. Um, so have we got some idea of what she did in Italy um, and what happened to her in Italy, please? Yeah, um, well, she was actually, she'd always wanted to go to the States. And she tried desperately to go to the States. And she tried from Italy as well. Um, she wasn't able to, which is why she came here. Um, now, I'm trying to think. I think you had some pictures of the Didama. I, there's I did, and I do them. have it, and I'm just... I just think they're quite interesting because they're a little bit different and show um, something that I just want to talk a little bit more about, sure. if we can see sure. them. Um, okay, I just need to screen share. Sorry, I'm being a bit basic here. Sorry, don't worry. Let's see if we can see them again. There they are, yes. Yeah, this is from, this is from the exhibition. You've got th um, three of the main pieces uh, from Didam that were in amongst her papers. And <coughs> excuse <coughs> me. And these at the bottom are the workbooks that she, very nice um, books with very nice cloth bindings, scrapbooks of her work that she collected and took with her. She took. Um, a, a lot of examples of her work. I guess it was going to be her calling card when she got somewhere else. Um, but also, I think, a, a sense of the importance of the things that she was doing, um, very beautifully kept by her um, and in her archive. Great, thank you. Um, so we've talked a little bit about her career. I've got couple I know we're running out of, it's uh, out of time um but I do want to just um really think about um because this is part of an insiders outsiders event about um her importance she's one of many refugees from Nazism to come and work here and really change design um but to some extent, as you say in the film, um, she's been forgotten. Why, why do you think that is? Can we just think about, about that? Why isn't she perhaps as well known as, as um, some of the, you know, some of the men, <laughs> let's think about it, um, who, who were refugees from Nazism, who also came here, um, including typographers. I mentioned Bertolt Volpe, um, mm. but also somebody like um, Hans Schmoller from, um, who became a head of Penguin, and I think commissioned the beautiful wig Waggly Penguin. Yeah, I, I mean, there are various people at Penguin who commissioned Friedlander. Uh, yeah, um, she, why would she have not been? Uh, the, the big deal, the big deal she had, the big break she had was doing that typeface in Berlin in her early life. Then when she was traveling as a refugee, both in Italy working for Mondadori and Domus, she was doing um, very nice, uh, but dust jackets. I mean, it's not quite in the same league as being asked to design a typeface. And the same thing happened when she came to England. She was given lots of very nice work and some of it quite important work. But it's things like the beautiful decorative papers 
I mean, they were exquisite and she did everything absolutely with total commitment, but they don't have the same kind of kudos. Now, whether that was because of her as a person, um, a kind of, I mean, English society was frankly sexist, racist and all the rest of it in that era. Um, she was considered I, somebody, who was it? Nicholas Barker, um, who had worked um, as a publisher and was also, also worked at the British Library, said that somebody had told him that she was unclubbable. Um, in other words, she wasn't arm candy. Um, and she was quiet, but from what one can gather, she didn't suffer fools. So she wasn't going to be the kind of person who would sweep into a room. And in that era, um, I think it was very hard for women if they couldn't do that as well, or didn't want to, not interested. Um, yeah, it, it was a man's world, the world of typography, hugely a man's world. Um, yeah. yeah. So I, I should think that's why. Also, very strangely, there's there was nothing kept at the Ben Uri um, exhibition she did. You know, people didn't keep things. I find that bizarre, but you know, you'd think that would have been kept at least. Indeed, indeed. Um, I really struggled to find when we were, were we doing designs on um, Britain, even, you know, <laughs> trying to get the Jewish Chronicle. Uh, she did she did um, the typography for, for the title page of the um, Jewish Chronicle. Trying to get that from the Jewish Chronicle proved difficult. We luckily found it um, elsewhere. Okay. I want to finish off um, by you said it comes up in the film about the violin um, and we don't find out about the violin. So can you finish off by telling us what did happen to the violin? Yeah, the violin. Um, well, Friedlander had a, a, became ill. I think she had uterine cancer. Her friend um, Sheila Goldberg looked after her at the end of her life and she gave her violin and her her archive to Sheila Goldberg. Um, Sheila gave the violin to the Cork School of Music and they use it, still use it as a as a kind of um, special thing for their star pupil for to borrow for a year. Um, so it's still in circulation. And for the exhibition, um, Donna Steele at Ditchling managed to get the violin and we put it in a display case with some of the Penguin Music series that she'd done the designs of the papers for. So I'm just going to try and share that with everyone. Those, so those beautiful papers that feature in the film, we'll see them in a minute, were actually um, for the covers of these um, books. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they're just so beautiful. I agree. We also had them. We got a few of those in the exhibition. Naomi bought them off eBay every time. Yeah, I, got, I got mine off eBay. Absolutely <laughs> nothing to buy them and a beautiful thing to have. Look at them. They're so beautiful. And there's yeah. the violin. Yeah. Well, that's where I'm going to end it because we were, I, I want to leave time for questions. So I'm going to hand back to Monica for that. And thank you very much. It's been really wonderful. Thank you. Lovely. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, I'm aware of time, but I think there are a number of interesting <coughs> comments coming in that I'd like to chip in a little bit, if I may. Um, did you mention, I don't think I dozed off, I'm sure I didn't because I was listening intently. Did you mention the scholarship and the violin? I don't think you did, did you? Yeah. You, you did mention it? Mm -hmm. God, I'm sorry. In that case, I, that's a, an embarrassing moment. Sorry, because um, I think it's, it's a lovely, I mean, just to sort of... <laughs> Stop myself blushing. I think it's just a lovely way of making this connection between past and present. The idea that this sort of special object from her life, you know, has a has a life in, in, yeah. in the present, most most definitely. Um, right. Let me let me concentrate on the questions coming through first. Um, a question. I mean, this question of gender and reputation and to what extent they intersect. Um, a question from Vanessa King. First question: Did Elizabeth ever marry and have a family? I think. We probably all guessed the answer to that. You certainly didn't mention it. I'm guessing not if she worked for the Ministry of Information, but I think it's more than that, isn't it? I mean, she had this relationship, am I right? It was, was, was it a, an amorous relationship with the Italian you mentioned? I, I don't believe it was. Oh, okay. um, yeah. I, I know that some people think that it 
was, but she never lived with Sandro. Um, they were close friends. No, I, I, um, I had a little, I don't know if it, this is speculation, so it's perhaps not right for me to, and I hope nobody takes this as fact, but um, she did the uniform edition of Radcliffe Hall's work. Mm -hmm. And in the back of that, she signed herself slightly un, um, usually Elizabeth rather than Elizabeth Friedlander. And it started making me think because of her whole appearance and demeanor. Mm -hmm. And the thing that Alec Howe had said about um, her being a spinster. And we don't think twice when somebody says um, a confirmed bachelor in those days, we know what that means. And I kind of thought, well, maybe being a spinster means that too. So I don't know, but um, as far as I know, she, she didn't have any um, romantic relationships that at least we know about. Certainly intriguing indeed. Um, right, from, is it Bar yes, Barbara? Um, I'm pleased to see the exhibition at Ditchling again. Yes, indeed. I mean, it's a crying shame it never traveled. I know that you tried and indeed I tried to do my bit. Nobody wanted to take it. What a shame, what a shame. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Um, uh, However, uh, from Barbara Still, um, when I was at Kinsale during that very summer, I visited the church, especially to see her work in situ, but was unable to find it and no mention, as far as I could see, of her work or presence in Kinsale. I mean, is that still true today? And on the yeah, back of I, that, I mean, did your exhibition make a difference? Has there been more appreciation in Ireland of her, her achievement? I, I, I think probably quite a bit, but I went to Kinsale. I managed to track down Roma Peer, um, who was the widow of the... Um, Oh, what do you call the pastor anyway of that church um, who was very nice and I went and had tea with her me and my daughter went and had tea with her and met her son um, the inscription was missing there had been various changes of rectors mm -hmm. since then nobody knew where it was um, they all seemed slightly appalled it was missing but it was just missing um, and I got some nice anecdotes about um, her later life from people who she had sat in her sitting room in front of a fire and she had a piano as well as her violin and so on. So it all sounded very nice. Um, just some little domestic details there. Mm. And is access to the archive still almost impossible? I mean, has anything changed? Uh, I don't know. Um, I don't think it has. They haven't listed it properly. It was, um, it took a, a, a lot of persuasion to get in there. And um, yeah, it's not archived. I mean, they don't have the money to do it. Mm -hmm. And I think possibly, you know, it's a little bit of a nuisance. Somebody need, who needs to go, who knows what they're looking at. So not only do you need to be interested in typography and recognize the people whose letters or notes or whatever were kept, mm -hmm. But you also need to have a little bit of historical interest and knowledge of, of her life. And there doesn't seem to be that currently. I just hope somebody else picks it up and runs with it at some mm -hmm. point. But it is all there. And I mean, it is being looked after. It's just not accessible, which is rather frustrating. <laughs> it's actually rather shocking, isn't it? But uh, yeah. we'll leave that issue there for the moment. Another question from Vanessa King, who obviously knows quite a lot about um, uh, typography. I'm wondering whether there are quite sort of technical and, and almost economic reasons why um, she's not remembered to do with changes in typesetting, uh, economics, etc. Is it more expensive to use such fonts. And then as a kind of the flip side of that from Sybil Sheridan, um, Catherine says that the Elizabeth typeface is still used. Where, where, where might we see it? Right. Well, um, I know that um, the Incline Press, which is a press um, that actually the, the produced the Pauline Pauker book. That, I mean, it's a small edition. So we're talking about an old fashioned printing press. Um, they have quite a lot of Elizabeth typeface. Graham, who runs it, uh, brought it back, I think, in a knapsack, almost as scrap metal during the 60s when he was backpacking. Um, and I think there are various other places where there are small amounts of the metal press. The matrices we thought were lost, but may not be. 
um, the Hartman grandson who's in um, Barcelona thinks that they went to somebody else. And I haven't followed that one through because it would mean trips to Germany and a whole load of other research. And actually this isn't my work, I'm an artist. Um, so I'm, again, I would hope that somebody might take that up. Um, it has been digitized, as I said, but uh, Bauer have digitized it and you can buy, it, I think it's 60 euros and I bought it and I used it and it's in, you know, the, the digital typeface that I use in the film is, is that. And it's good, it's very good, mm -hmm. but it's not as beautiful and quite as quirky and elegant as the metal that Friedlander did. Yeah. Thinking again about gender and reputation, in spite of what Julia says that perhaps somebody like Volpe is relatively speaking better known, is it not also true as a kind of more general statement that typographers tend not to get they don't become household names. They don't, you know, then, you know, you recognize, I think I suspect many of us will have one of those beautiful music volumes in our, in our house somewhere. So one recognizes the look without necessarily knowing mm. the name of the maker. So I think that's the kind of, you know, something to, to bear in mind. And that, that's rather wonderful in a way that, you know, the look and, and it's, it's so distinctive and, you know, still, still appreciated. And, and perhaps, I mean, perhaps also the difference is Volker went on um, doing type design when he came to Britain. I'm not sure. Friedlander didn't get that chance again. Absolutely. I wonder if we might conclude, um, Catherine, with asking you to say something about the film as a film, because as I said at the very beginning, I suspect many people would have, ex you know, were expecting a more straightforward narrative documentary style film, and it's clearly not that. Uh, would you like to just comment on, you know, the way you, the way you set about making the film? Um, well, it started off with a, a series of stills ah. because what I had with me when I went was a very, to Cork, was a very old mm -hmm. um, digital camera, so, but which had a very nice autofocus. And I just snapped as I was going through papers, which was actually very, um, it was very convenient because of things not being listed. It meant when I'd seen something, I could ask for it again. One couldn't describe it because there was no description, but one could give an image and eventually things would come back that I thought were needed for the exhibition. Um, so I, the film started with a series of films and uh, stills. And then um, a kind of idea around how you tell a story that you don't really know. And of course, no stories one ever can know. And I think it comes out of um, very much a, a kind of experimental filmmaking practice that I was trained in in the 80s, a sort of artist filmmaking practice, um, which would have been a, a very much counter Hollywood kind of aesthetic where you would expect the viewer to have to do a certain amount of work probably and to think about um, the material values that you're seeing rather than just sort of assume a kind of smooth flow of um, factual narrative everything starts to need to have um, its construction made more apparent and that, I guess, is where I'm coming from. I haven't left my, behind the narrative content at all, which I know more extreme people would have done, um, because I think, well, stories need to be told, but with, within a, a kind of questioning, um, the story was told, if that makes sense. No, it makes absolute yeah. sense. And, and the find... same for the uh, same thing for the images, really. Mm -hmm. No, and I've find it particularly poignant, you know, this is a story of a Jewish woman refugee, that actually that sense of the elusiveness of her story and the way that us now, you, me, you know, in the in the present can never do anything but grasp at its, you, 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 you know, at its meaning, at, at its significance, and it's always slipping away. I was very struck by a number of things. You, except it wasn't you, was it? It was obviously an actress in a sense, being you, which is another interesting thing perhaps to talk about, but maybe not <laughs> today. But you know, you said things like, you know, where is she to be found? Um, I'm hoping for something solid, but it keeps slipping away. It seemed to me that, you know, the whole way in which you crafted this film is very much about that and it makes it material, if you like, makes it sort of manifest. Lovely. Well, we could go on, but I think probably we ought to stop there unless there are any other questions. I can't see any others coming in right now. 
actually, I mean, perhaps I could just sort of end with that question. Why did you choose <coughs> to narrate the film yourself? Um, I wanted, I wanted a cork voice actually, mm -hmm. um, and that was quite important. Yeah. Um, I had hope for Fiona Shaw, but couldn't afford her because it was an unfunded thing. Mm -hmm. um, and I found Aideen O'Donoghue online and she was very happy to work for 50 euros an hour and we used two hours and mm -hmm. that, you know, yeah. that was that. It was sort of two takes and we're off. Um, I find it very hard listening to my own voice back. Um, I think I find it much easier to have somebody stand in for. And after all, in terms of the material, everybody, everything, everybody in that is somehow standing in because we don't really know. So there's that sort of elusiveness about it and inflections of accents and so on. It just seemed to make sense. Indeed. Lovely. Um, perhaps I can just end bringing things down again to sort of more, you know, the biography and the, the, the story itself. Um, as some of you may know, uh, there was, in fact, a first um, um, session in this series, a talk by Peter Pomerantsev, um, who is in the process of actually researching and ultimately writing a book about black propaganda during the Second World War. And he's on the trail of Elizabeth. And I think he's, you know, he's a oh, good great. investigative journalist. So I'm willing to bet that he will find out quite a lot more, which will be really fascinating to, to hear, hear about in due course. But also Charmian Brinson, who gave another talk in the same series when she was talking about her recently published book called Working for the War Effort, and then subtitled German Speaking Refugees and British Propaganda during the Second World War. She does mention Elizabeth, albeit it rather fleetingly it's a book that covers many different aspects of propaganda but you know she's kind of in there as part of this bigger story so members of the audience <laughs> might like to look out for that lovely so let me just end by saying that this is the penultimate um, event in our uh, spies lies and secret mission series quite clearly as in every event you know the wartime activities are so it's always part of a bigger, fascinating individual story. And I think what we've been discussing today bears that out absolutely. Um, the last um, session, this time next week, is um, also going to be fascinating, very, very different. Um, it's about a Portuguese diplomat, a consul in Bordeaux in France, called Aristides de Souza Mendes, who, talk about unsung heroes, I mean, he, managed to illicitly or semi-illicitly um, um, issue thousands of visas to those in need, those who so desperately needed to flee from France during the Second World War. And we're very pleased because there is in fact a de Souza Mendes Foundation in the States and members of that foundation are going to be talking about their activities, obviously about his story, and also indeed about the artworks that have been commissioned or indeed been you know, sort of prompted by his remarkable um, story. So yes, we hope to see you. We hope to see you there next next Thursday. So all it remains for me to do is to thank everybody for their comments and questions and for being here tonight. But of course, above all, to Julia and the person without whom we wouldn't have been here at all, Catherine. It's a beautiful film, and uh, thank you so much for allowing us to enjoy it, and indeed for being in conversation with Julia afterwards. And good night, you. everyone. Uh, be well and uh, look after yourselves. All the very best. <laughs>